morning. Good morning. It's uh, certainly great to, to be with all of you uh, here again this morning, and uh, thank you all for uh, welcoming, me, welcoming me back uh, here this morning. And uh, again, my prayers are with uh, Pastor Danny and, and his family as uh, they travel, and uh, and pray that he'll be back uh, here safely uh, with, with you all. But again, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to share the word of the Lord with you here this morning. Well, I want to tell you there was a recital that happened where all the students in the music class were expected to perform a selection. And the day for that recital happened to come, and these children that were performing, they were around 12 years of age or so, somewhere around that age. And each one of them had to perform on the organ. And so each child walked up and did their selection there on the organ, and everything was, was going well. There was even uh, one girl that sat down at the organ and knew how to adjust the sliding controls and everything on the organ and played her selection flawlessly. And it was like that for pretty much all of them, well, except for one student. Well, this, this student sat down at the organ, ran his fingers over the keys, looked around and then said in a still small voice, I don't know my piece, and sat back in one of the chairs. Now, I can't imagine probably the embarrassment and shame that that child probably felt at that time because this was a time where basically it counted. How long had that person known when showtime was approaching? We don't really know. Did the child have time to practice? Don't really know that either. Or it may have been just stage fright. You know, because some people, you know, have that type of fright when they have to get in front of a whole bunch of people. Now, we'll never know exactly what that child experienced, but I'm pretty sure that probably shame was probably one of the feelings that that child experienced. Well, there will come a day when we Christians will be standing in front of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And thankfully, when that day does come, we already know where our destination is going to be. Well, however, the reason why we're going to be standing in front of the Lord Jesus Christ, as I'll, as I'll explain here in just a moment, is because he'll be giving us rewards based on how we served him here on this earth. Now, we're going to be back into the book of First John, just like uh, we were the, a couple of weeks ago when I was here. So if you want to turn to First John, if you have your Bibles with you. And today we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verse 28, and I'll be going through chapter 3, verse 3. So we'll just be looking at five verses uh, here this morning. But just to give you a little bit of background information, the passage of verses 17 through yeah, 17 through uh, 27, John had just explained that, number one, the main Antichrist was coming, and then he also talked about the Antichrist, those that had the spirit of Antichrist. Basically, again, he was talking about the Gnostics. They had the spirit of the Antichrist because they were teaching false teachings. And again, I'll go over a little bit here in just a moment about about some of the beliefs that they had. But in this part of the letter, John wanted to give the Christians there in Ephesus an encouragement. And if there was something they probably needed at that time, it was definitely encouragement because, again, a schism had happened, or a split had happened in the church because of these false teachers. And they probably needed some encouragement in their faith because I'm sure they probably had faced major temptation on leaving the faith. And so John writes in this section of scripture that he wants them to continue to abide in Christ. And what we're going to be looking at here this morning in each of these verses, each verse has one characteristic of what that abiding hope is, and that's what we'll be talking about this morning. Before I get into the message, let's read the scripture. And again, the scripture is 1 John chapter 2, and I'll start at verse 28, and we'll just be going through uh, chapter 3, verse 3. And here's what the word of the Lord says. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence 
and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. And may God bless the reading and the understanding of his word. And I'm asking you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach your word here this morning. And I just thank you, Lord, for this passage of scripture as you be sharing with us from your word five things that we can take with us in having abiding hope in Christ. Heavenly Father, I just pray that through the Holy Spirit you would help me to preach your word as it is, with as much passion as I can, and I pray that you would help my words be your words. And I pray for everyone that's uh, here this morning, or those that will be uh, listening to the message later, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that they will not only receive the message with their minds and their hearts, but I also pray, Lord, that they'll be able to apply the message to their lives as well. And I especially pray for those that do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that if they don't have that personal relationship, I pray that here today that they would make that decision because they may never have another chance after today. And I pray, Lord, that they would repent of their sins, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins and arose again the third day to conquer their sin and death. And I pray, Lord, that they would confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that he is their Lord and Savior. And I pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll look at verse 28 first in chapter 2. And the first characteristic of abiding hope that we see in verse 28 is the word confidence. It's the word confidence. And again, verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him. Now, if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that word abide. And in fact, the word uh, abide appears a lot in John's writings, not only here in 1 John, but also in the Gospel of John as well. And again, uh, the Greek word for that is meno, which means this, to remain, to stay in the same place. So John is, is encouraging the Christians there at Ephesus, and he's encouraging us that we need to remain in Christ forever and ever. In other words, we are to be in fellowship with Christ. And again, I can't help but to go back to that passage in the Gospel of John that talks about abiding in him in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, verse 2, it says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, what Jesus is saying, and he says in this passage as well explicitly, is that we can't do nothing apart from Christ. And when it comes to following the Lord Jesus Christ, we can't do it without his strength. If we want to do great things for the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be abiding in him and draw our strength from him in order to follow him. Because we're not able to do it on our own. I can tell you from personal experience, when I try to do it on my own, I fail at it, and I fail at it miserably. And probably many of you, if not all of you, probably would say the same thing, that you've tried it at one point or another in your life, that you tried to follow Christ on your own strength, and it didn't work. Well, we need to depend on the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to follow him. But then we see here in this second part of the verse, so it says, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So we see here, this is where John is introducing the term of Christ's second coming. And the Greek word for Christ's coming here is called parousia. And this word basically describes a dignitary that's coming to town. So back then, of course, they had kings. So they would describe that event as a parousia when a king would come to a town to, to visit. 
And what would happen is the king would send a messenger ahead of him to let that town know the king is coming. And so the messenger delivers that message, the town prepares for the king to come, and then the king comes. If you want to translate that to our time today, it would be something similar with the president of the United States. Uh, someone from the Secret Service would come and make sure everything is prepared and everything to where the president will, uh, will be coming. And then after that, then the president comes. That kind of fits along with that Greek term as well. Well, it's the same thing with Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is our king. And one day he will be returning uh, to not only come for us for the rapture, but he will also come and establish his millennial kingdom here on the earth as well. And so John wanted the Christians to be prepared for that second coming. He wanted them to make sure that they had confidence when they would stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the event that John is describing here is called the judgment seat of Christ. And again, this is where believers will go. We're, we'll be raptured from the earth. And then after we're raptured, we're going to be in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to be answered to him for how we have served him on this earth. Now, let's not get that confused with the great white throne judgment that we see in Revelation. That is where the unbelievers will go, and that's where they'll be sentenced to be eternally separated from the Lord Jesus Christ into the lake of fire. At the Bema Seat of Christ, again, our eternal destination is not determined there because when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that question was already settled. Again, this is where we're going to be standing in front of the Lord Jesus. We're going to be answering to him for how we have served him on this earth. And he'll be giving us rewards based on how we have served him on this earth. There will be some that will have a lot of rewards. There will be some that will probably have some rewards, and there will be some there. They will probably not receive any rewards, and those will be the ones that will probably have shame in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John wants to, us to avoid that by letting us know we need to be prepared for the Lord's coming because we don't know when he's coming. We know that he is coming, but it, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be another thousand years from now. John didn't know then when Jesus Christ will return. And today, even us, we don't know exactly when Jesus Christ will return. But we need to be prepared like he is going to be coming today. So, John is telling us that we need to be prepared. As Dr. Tom Thatcher writes, he says, Those who deserve judgment fear the presence of the judge, while the innocent may approach the judge boldly. So if we are truly serving the Lord Jesus Christ, when we stand in, front of him, stand in front of him with confidence, but if we're not living the way that we should, and then we stand in front of him, then we're not going to be standing up there as confident, will we? One of the worst things that we can do is we'll be participating in sin, and then the next thing we know, the rapture happens, and the next person we see is the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, as Paul writes, as, we'll, as I'll talk about in just a moment, it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. One second we may be seeing each other, the next second we may be seeing the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we need to be prepared for that moment. As Hebrews chapter 3 verse 6 says, it says, But as Christ, but, excuse me, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. So when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to hold fast to that confidence that we are not only truly serving him, but when we stand in front of him one day, we can be confident in how we have served him. Now, of course, Jesus knows that even the best of us that truly serve him, we're going to make mistakes from time to time. And Jesus knows that. And that's why John wrote earlier in this letter in 1 John 1, 9, that, if, that Jesus is faithful and, and, and just in forgiving us of our sins if we confess it. To him. But you know, for those that are unbelievers, Jesus wants them to approach him as well. As the writer of Hebrews writes in chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly until, unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So whether we're unbelievers looking for salvation for the first time, or even as believers, that may have strayed away. 
We can come to the throne of God boldly and with confidence, knowing that he'll extend that grace to us. But as I've just mentioned, if Christians do not abide in Jesus while on earth, they will stand ashamed in front of him at the judgment seat of Christ. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So there ain't going to be anybody that's going to be exempt from the judgment seat of Christ, just like there won't be any unbelievers that will be exempt from the great white throne judgment. But again, when we are in front of the Lord Jesus for the judgment seat of Christ, they will be either receiving rewards or we'll end up losing rewards, depending on how we've served him here on this earth. So the first thing, characteristic we see here in, in abiding hope is confidence. Number two, the second characteristic we see in verse 29, and that characteristic is habitual righteousness. Habitual righteousness. In verse 29 it says, If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. So we all know that Jesus Christ is righteous. The scripture is pretty clear on that, and I think we pretty much know that ourselves, that he is righteous. What John is saying here is that since we know that Jesus Christ is righteous, we as Christians should also be righteous as well. Because if we call ourselves Christians, then we need to be just like Jesus Christ. Now, of course, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, we are righteous positionally. But however, it doesn't just stop there. We also need to be continuing to abide in him throughout our life from that point forward until we're with the Lord Jesus Christ to become more righteousness. The official theological term for this is called progressive sanctification, which basically means this, is that from the time that we are saved up until the time that we're with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus is setting us apart for us to be more like him. And in order for him to do that, we need to abide in him throughout the rest of our life. Paul writes on this as well in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. And this is probably a section of scripture you might be familiar with. In verse 8 he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So Paul is saying here that works is not going to save you. When it comes to salvation, it is through faith in Jesus Christ. However, we are saved for a reason. Number one is because to save us from our sins, but then Paul writes the, another reason in verse 10 where he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So in other words, Paul is saying this, we're not saved by our good works. However, we are saved for good works. And there's a, there's a difference there. There are people who believe you can be saved by good works. And I'm going to tell you according to what the scripture says, if that's what you believe, you're not going to make it to heaven. Because there's going to be something that's going to prevent you from going there. And all it takes is just one sin. And you're disqualified from heaven. The only way you can get to heaven is faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. However, if we are truly saved, then we would want to be righteous because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Some people try to serve the Lord Jesus Christ by trying to do things so they could try to earn his favor or try to, to make him pleased with him. But we have to understand when we put our faith and trust in him, we've already pleased God. We are already good, you know, good as far as being saved. But the reason why that we do righteous works is because we're appreciative of what he's done for each and every one of us. So we're serving, we're supposed to be serving out of gratitude for what he has done for us. And that's a big difference between serving out of gratitude and serving because we feel like we have to do something in order for him to be pleased. Now again, as I mentioned earlier, 
One of the reasons why John wrote this letter was because of a group that caused a split in the church, which was called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics basically believed this, that the spirit was good, but the physical was evil. So what they believed was this, was that the spirit was good and was untouched by physical matter. And because of that belief, here's how they applied it to their life. They, the Gnostics believed that they could sin flagrantly without remorse or consequence since their spirits remained untouched by sin. They claimed to be Christian, to know God, but they hated Christians and lived sinful lives. So basically the Gnostics believe that since their spirit was good, they can just go out and do whatever they want. And unfortunately, I hate to say it, but that belief is even still going on even today. You'll have people that look at salvation as a get out of hell free card. They've got their salvation taken care of and they're like, okay, well now since I've got that taken care of, now I can go back and do what I want. No, that's not the way it's supposed to go. And that's not the way Jesus wants us to do things. Yes, he wants us to be saved. But that doesn't mean that we go back and do what we want after we are saved. Because we had to be saved for a reason. Because sin hurts us. And sin can mess up our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as uh, David Walls and Max Anders writes, they say, God inspired this letter to challenge such people's claims to know Jesus. They must do what is right to validate that they are Christian. If they claim to be Christian, but do not do what is right, they are not Christian. So here's what they're saying. If someone says that they're Christian, but their life consistently says something else, then they're not Christian. Now again, we all make mistakes. And and John even writes, and if you were to look in the Greek, what he means is, is that if you're truly a Christian, your lifestyle should consistently show that. Again, Jesus knows that we're going to make mistakes. So John is not saying we have to be absolutely perfect, because let's just be honest. If we had to be absolutely perfect, it would be none of us here that would have any hope. I know I wouldn't have any hope. And probably none of you would have any hope because there's only been one perfect person that's walked this earth. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody else has walked this earth perfectly like he has. However, if we are truly Christian, then our life should show consistently that we are followers of Jesus. If we say that we're followers of Jesus, but our life shows that we're living just like Satan, especially before we, before we were supposedly saved, then something is wrong. Something went terribly wrong, and, it's, and it's, it's either one of two reasons. Either one, the person didn't mean it, or number two, Jesus made a mistake. And last time I checked, Jesus doesn't make any mistakes. So it was probably the first reason, is that they didn't mean it to begin with. And I'll tell you this also, you're not going to fool the Lord Jesus Christ either. Because Jesus knows everything, and he especially knows our heart. So if we do make that decision, we do have to mean it with our hearts. And as David Walls and Max Anders writes also, they say, our righteousness must be motivated by our knowledge that he is righteous. Only when our good deeds are done in response to our desire to serve Jesus, only when our acts are an expression and outworking of our faith in him, is God pleased. And so again, they're just basically saying there, that if we're truly Christian, our actions will show that we are Christian. And we're doing it not because out of obligation, we're doing it because we are thankful for what the Lord Jesus Christ did for each and every one of us. So we see in abiding hope you have confidence, you have habitual righteousness, and then we get to the third characteristic, going into chapter 3 now, verse 1. And this characteristic is wondrous love. It is wondrous love. And verse 1 of chapter 3 says this, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 
So we see here in the first part of this, this verse where he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We see here that John is just wondrously wondering about the awesome love that God shows each and every one of us. Because let's just be honest, there is nothing that we could do to earn his love. God chose to love us despite of our sinfulness. As Robert Leitner writes, he says, all God's people need to stop whatever we are doing and take notice of our Heavenly Father's love. It is a great love, unique, unusual, and superior to every other love we could experience. You see, we live in a society today that we're just so busy, we just don't have much time to do pretty much anything. But I think it would be good if we Christians could just take the time and just meditate and just think about the awesome love that God shows each and every one of us. As John 3.16, I know for me personally, it was probably the first verse that I ever memorized. But however, if we just really sit down and think about what that verse means, I think we have a much better appreciation of what that love truly means. And again, God chose to love us despite of our sinfulness. Danny Aiken writes this. He says, It is a gift from God the Father that cannot be earned or bought. It is given freely and cannot be withdrawn. Furthermore, God has not just shown his love to humans, but he has given it to them in such a way that it becomes a part of them. He lavishes or imparts permanent and abiding love to his children. So may we never forget the love that God has shown each and every one of us by sacrificing his own son so that we can have a personal relationship with him. And then we see the second part of that, of that verse where it says, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. And again, the term here for world is cosmos, which is referring to the system of the world that is influenced by Satan. And of course, since it's influenced by Satan, the people that follow it do not know the Lord. And since Christ was not of this world, we Christians are not of this world either when we abide in him. And that's the reason why if, if they don't know Christ, guess what? They're not going to know us either because we are of Christ and not of this world. In fact, Jesus says this in John 15, 18 through 19, where he says, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So Jesus is perfectly clear that if we truly follow the Lord Jesus Christ, the world is not going to love us. The world is not going to embrace us. In fact, the world is probably going to hate us. And we see that becoming more and more true in our world today, isn't it? There are many people around the world that are Christians, but they live in the part of the world that if they were to say that they were believers, they would be killed for their faith. And I believe even here in our country, I think we're, this country is starting to become more and more hostile towards Christians. We're not in the place yet where, where it's severe persecution like in other areas of the world. But I would not be surprised if we head down that direction. In fact, I believe we will be heading down that direction. I believe there will, be, there will come a time where we may not be able to do what we're doing here this morning, which is to meet publicly in a church building. We may end up having to do in some other countries, maybe have house churches or something like that, or meet underground, because the world is becoming more and more hostile to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to realize that when we stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, it's probably not going to be a popular decision, but it's going to be the right decision. And we need to understand that it's better to have the fear of God than the fear of man. Yes, man might be able to do some physical things toward us, but man can't send us to hell. Man can't take away our faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that if we're a part of Christ, the world will hate us. So we see that there's confidence and abiding hope. We see there's wondrous love and abiding hope. There is habitual righteousness and abiding hope. Then the fourth characteristic in verse 2, we are sanctified. We are sanctified. Verse 2, it says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So again, John is saying here, because we have accepted that gift of salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ, we are sons and daughters of God. However, in order for us to continue to be more like him, again, as I mentioned earlier, we need to continue to abide in him. And again, that's called progressive sanctification. Because you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns for us, we will be like him and our sanctification will be complete because we will see him as he is. So we're on this journey of becoming more like Christ right now as we speak. Again, it starts from the time when you're saved until the time you're with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul even writes about this moment in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 52 through 54. And he writes, he says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So he says in that verse that in that moment when the rapture happens, all the dead will rise first, and then those of us that are still living will be caught up with the dead, and we'll all receive glorified bodies. As verse 53 and 54 say, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Because you see, the only way that we could be resurrected was that Jesus Christ had to be resurrected first. And of course, we know that he was resurrected. And because of that, he not only won the victory over sin, but he also won the victory over death as well. But until that day comes, we are to be sanctified and continue to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we going to do it perfectly? No, we're not. But the more that we get to know Jesus Christ, the closer that we are to him, and the more that we will become like the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, the final characteristic in verse 3. The final characteristic of abiding hope is that we are purified. Is that we are purified. In verse 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purified himself, even as he is pure. So since we are saved, we become more like him because we have that desire to be more like him. And it's because... We love him, and we are thankful for what he has done for us. Again, as Danny Aiken writes, our hope is founded upon Christ. There is nothing within the believer that creates hope and security for the future. The foundation for hope, now and forever, is Christ alone. So in order for us to be purified, we have to put our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also want to be prepared for his return as well. And that's part of that process of sanctification is being purified. And Christ will purify us of our sin just like he is pure. As 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And so... We want to be purified from sins that we're struggling with. We need to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do that, then he will certainly purify us from our sins. So let me share with you this last story to conclude this morning. You see, 
Abiding hope weans God's people from seeking and trusting this world. There was this young lady named Maria who lived in a small town in southern Kentucky, and she didn't hear from her husband for years. And the reason why is because he was in the Army. In fact, he was assigned to the 2nd Infantry Division during the Korean War. And he ended up being captured when the Chinese overpowered their positions in North Korea in February 1951. And Maria remembered very vividly of when officers visited her home. For those of you that either have, either have family members or know of people that were part of the military, when you have officers come visit your home, usually that's not a good sign. And when she saw these military officers walking to her front porch, to her front door, she began to cry because she knew that there was bad news that was coming. And the officers knocked on the door and they told her that Edward could not be accounted for. He was missing in action and presumed to be a prisoner of war. But despite all that, Maria still held out hope, even though she knew the chances of, of his survival were grim. And as the war dragged on, she felt grief at times. But she never gave up and never even considered moving on with life and living as if Edward were dead. No, she remained steadfast and faithful and hopeful, and she did this for two long, agonizing years. But then 1953 came along, and without warning, the officers showed up to her door again. But she noticed something different this time around. She noticed that this time they had a spring in their step when they came. Maria could sense that this was joyful news. And sure enough, the officers told her that Edward was alive. He was part of a prisoner exchange in Pamunjom, and he was on his way to Walter Reed Hospital for some treatment and nourishment, and then he would be returning home. Well, in a similar way, hope gives us the incentive to remain faithful and pure, knowing <coughs> that one day we will be reunited with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us have confidence first of all, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We can certainly trust him and his word. Let us make a habit of righteousness based on our love for Jesus Christ. Let us serve him because we love him, not because we need to please him. Third, let us take time to meditate on the wondrous love of God. And I encourage you this week during your quiet time, whenever you have it, to take some time this week to think about that wondrous love that God has offered us. Let us allow Jesus to sanctify and set us apart for him. Let him work his will through our lives. And then let us allow Jesus to purify us from our sins. And if we do those five things, then I believe that we can have true abiding hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I encourage you with that word here this week. So I'm going to ask you to join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word this morning. And I just thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture. And Heavenly Father, I just pray that we would continue to have abiding hope in you. And I just pray, Lord, that we don't place our hope in anything or anyone else. Heavenly Father, I do pray again, Lord, that if there is someone here this morning that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I pray that this morning that they would first repent of their sins, which means they stop doing things their way and start doing things God's way. 
But they believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins and arose again the third day to conquer their sin and death. And if they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, <clears throat> then Lord, I know that you will save them right where they're at. And I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit will work upon them now to make that decision. And Heavenly Father, if there are those here that already have that personal relationship with you, but they may have strayed away, which happens to all of us. Heavenly Father, I just pray that they would realize that you would welcome them back with open arms, that we can always come back to you. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would work on their lives and would lead them to come back to you asking for forgiveness and to start over anew. Heavenly Father, I just pray as we come to this invitation time, I pray that the Holy Spirit will work among us. And I pray that whatever responses need to be made will be made before we leave. And I pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.